we have formulated a joint hypothesis such as beta 2 and beta 3 and beta 4 equals 0 simultaneously, so a joint hypothesis. And in this segment, we will learn how to actually test one. The idea is to construct a discrepancy measure that is a ratio of two independent, independent estimates of sigma squared. And if the ratio gets too large, then we say something is fishy, we reject the hypothesis. The first estimate of sigma squared is valid whether or not the hypothesis is true. And the second is valid only when the hypothesis is true. So they should be the same, right? So when it gets too large, then we know it's not the same. And the hypothesis is not true. So the setup is as follows. We have a full model as usual with p variables. And I'm introducing the notation here that xq, so q, comes before p. q is smaller than p. And then I'm deleting the variables in the joint hypothesis that come after q. So the second, the reduced model, only has q variables. The ordering doesn't matter because I can always reorder the variables such that the additional variables that I want to set to zero come after the Q's variable. All right, step one. This is the usual estimate of sigma squared. It is the residual sums of squares of the full model divided by its degrees of freedom. Step two, get the reduced model corresponding to the hypothesis. And then we get another estimate of sigma squared based on the residuals of the reduced model. Now the degrees of freedom have changed because in the reduced model, we only have Q parameters, well, Q variables, and then there is beta zero. Whereas before we had more, we had P variables and beta zero. Now we do something unexpected. We take the difference of the sums of squares. So we take the hypothesized sums of squares minus the well sums of squares residuals minus the sums of squares residuals corresponding to the full model. This quantity is always positive because the hypothesis model is smaller, meaning leaving more room for error. So the sums of squares residuals here are larger than those corresponding to the full model. We also take, divide by the corresponding number of degrees of freedom. And this number of degrees of freedom is the additional variables that in the hypothesis I'm setting to zero. So if I'm trying to set three variables to zero, then P minus Q is three. This is always positive because Q is smaller than P. Now we have three estimates of sigma squared corresponding to the full model, to the reduced model, and a little bit tricky, taking the difference of the sum of squares residuals and dividing by the degrees of freedom. We now construct a discrepancy measure, so a statistic, and we use the estimate of the sigma squared of the full model and this third one, the difference. And the reason why we do that is because this one subtracts the residual sums of squares that even the full model has. And if we didn't do that, we would be double counting them in the numerator and the denominator. And that would mean that the two estimates would be dependent. So the two estimates of sigma squared would be dependent. 
Whereas now, because we are not double counting them, they are independent. It is much, much easier to construct a test statistic for with the assumption of independence. It's much easier than somehow trying to account for or adjust for the dependency. All right, now we have two independent estimates of sigma here. And we are, as we always do, we are looking at very large values for the statistic under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, right? We can control what's happening under the null hypothesis. And we can say, if we find a very large value that is unlikely to un occur under the null hypothesis, well, then the null hypothesis probably isn't true and we reject the null hypothesis. That's what we always do. So, this new statistic has two degrees of freedom for the numerator and for the denominator. Previously, the T statistic and the chi square statistic only had one degree of freedom, but this one has two. We take the ratio and the is F is the ratio of two independent chi-square distributions. We have chi-square distribution is the sums of squares divided by the appropriate degrees of freedom. And if there is no evidence against the null hypothesis, then both estimates of sigma squared are going to be roughly the same, right? So what we're saying is that the residuals that lead to the sigma squared from the full model are roughly of the same size as the ones from the smaller model, subtracting out the ones we already had for the full model. So that means if we have values much larger than one, that is evidence against the null hypothesis. Here we have two graphs of the distributions for different values for the degrees of freedom. On the right-hand side, we have the denominator degree of freedom 10. On the left-hand side, we have the denominator degree of freedom 100. And then each curve corresponds to different degrees of freedom in the numerator. If we observe a value that is very large, for example, 4, then under the null hypothesis, the probability that we are four or even larger than four is really, really small. I don't know what it might be here, but it looks small, like maybe a half percent or something like that. And then we say, well, under the null hypothesis, such a large value is very unlikely to occur, so we reject the hypothesis. All right, this concludes this segment.